Good afternoon, everybody. How are you doing? Pretty good. Good. How are you? Doing good. Thanks. I don't know how many ultimately we're going to have in our group here. I don't, I don't know, at least probably seven or eight. So we'll kind of wait a minute here. Where's everybody zooming in from? From Colorado. Colorado. Okay. Great. I'm from, from Michigan. Welcome. Hi, this is Vishal from Michigan as well. From Michigan. All right, very good. Um, well, as mentioned earlier, so my name is Phil Hanneman. I'm one of the uh, wrapping up pulmonary and critical care fellows at Indiana University. Um, so just a little bit about me. I did all my training there for residency and fellowship. Um, and I just moved to Tennessee and have taken a job in a uh, community practice just outside of the Knoxville area. So I'm kind of getting settled in uh, in the South for, for uh, my first time here. So things are going well. Um, so ultimately how this will play out, I think, is that, uh, and can everybody hear me okay, first of all? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's ironic because uh, I'm like the least techie person. I think this could be one of the uh, small groups where they'll kind of, you know, uh, be checking in on, make sure everything's are going, going smoothly. So um, ultimately, I'll be sharing the, uh, the, the two cases that we'll kind of be reviewing as a group here. Um, I hope, you know, I've heard that everybody, uh, you know, from the session on Wednesday, it went super smoothly and everybody is really um, interactive. So please feel free to, you know, jump in at any point with questions or, or uh, clarifications or anything or anything that you want to add to the discussion. So, um, you know, these things are, are always best when, uh, when people feel comfortable, you know, um, sharing what's on their mind and we'll, uh, we'll dive into it with that. So give me a sec to kind of share the boot camp slides here. All right. Is that showing up? Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So um, we're just going to dive right in here. And again, like I said, if for some reason I start cutting out or something like that, feel free to just, uh, um, you know, give me the high sign or something. We'll see if we can get things back on track. So we'll jump in with case for one. This is a 65 year old male who presents to the ER with uh, severe shortness of breath. Um, this is gonna play out exactly as you can imagine. Got a fever of 102 degrees uh, for the past four days along with myalgias and dry cough. He has minimal past medical history, previously healthy. When he showed up to the ER, uh, by the time you're evaluating, he's already on heated, humidified, high flow nasal cannula. So 100% FiO2 and 40 liters. So this is like the, uh, you know, the end of the road for you as a pulmonary fellow, we were like, okay, things are about to get serious. Uh, the patient is in moderate respiratory distress. He's tachycardic, he's got bilateral bronchi. Exams are as follows, 101.2 temperature. He's tachycardic to the 110s, blood pressure of 111 over 56, and a uh, SpO2 of 91%. Initial ABG shows a pH 7.46, PCO2 of 32, and a PAO2 of 57. You're, you ask the RT, are you sure this is arterial? They're like, yes, this is arterial. So that's always the standard too, right? So given the high oxygen requirements, their distress, um, the decisions made to obviously intubate the patient. You start him on, depending on which center you're at, um, assist control, volume control, uh, ventilation, or uh, pressure regulated volume control, a volume control mode of ventilation. A rate of 16, tidal volume of 550, PEEP of 5, and FiO2 of 100%. After 30 minutes, uh, the repeat gas is still not great. In fact, it's awful. 7.43, 34, 66 on 100%. Um, this table below, you're concerned about the possibility of ARDS. And uh, as Dr. Smith already alluded to, kind of the Berlin definition, you order a chest X-ray and a BNP. BNP is normal, chest X-ray shows bilateral airspace disease. He is positive for influenza. Um, so based on what we know, question number one is, how severe is this patient's ARDS? How do we stratify that? And again, anybody can feel free to jump in. We'll just kind of take so we turns. Look at the P to F ratio. 
Yeah. Yep. 60 seconds. So he'd be severe. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, yeah. you're picking the PAO too. Yeah. So a PA, the math is way easier when they're on 100%, right? So 66 <laughs> over one, because uh, um, you're using the uh, the fraction of FiO2. And yeah, so the, I mean, absolutely, this is already in severe territory. Um, so yeah, we, we kind of already touched on Berlin criteria and, and you folks who are residents, rising fellows, you know, you've probably already been teaching certainly the basics of ARDS to your medical students and such for a long time. So we know the basic criteria that um, uh, Berlin criteria got, uh, you know, updated from previous criteria. This was back in 2012. Um, and the big difference at that time was that there was this term acute lung injury and that kind of got um, thrown to the wayside. Uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, the PF uh, ratio that was used as, uh, you know, using these different cutoffs, uh, mild, moderate, and severe, this was a new, a new way of doing business in terms of actually categorizing the severity. Um, and there, there is importance with that because um, the severity has been used as uh, a threshold point for various um, therapy and treatment algorithms and, and many studies. Um, and, you know, even though it's not a particularly sensitive uh, 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 marker for mortality, we, we know that, you know, in patients with severe ARDS, the mortality approach is 50%. So it, it does help at least give some, uh, you know, painting with a broad brush for, uh, for the clinician and for the patient and their family. Um, the other big change at this time was this criteria that uh, required um, a, uh, a wedge pressure. So a, you know, in which in prior times when we were using swan gains catheters with a great deal of regularity um, and, and, you know, obtaining wedge pressures on these patients to, you know, get a better sense for uh, what's going on from that standpoint. Now, you know, knowing that we really don't do swan gans routinely as part of our practice in the ICU. It's really just in very rare scenarios, probably most commonly in patients with severe uh, pulmonary hypertension who are in the ICU, for example. Um, but previously, the old guidelines required that the wedge pressure be less than 18. So we had to prove that the patient was not in um, cardiogenic, you know, failure as the etiology of this. But, you know, the reality is these Patients are often with multimorbidities and have lots of other things going on anyway. So you can have ARDS and have heart failure at the same time. Um, so those are the big changes when uh, the Berlin definition was, uh, was developed, you know, 18 years ago. So again, we've already established that the patient's ARDS is severe. Um, and, you know, it's important that, you know, you all as uh, pulmonary physicians here, um, in the making are, are, you know, very familiar with all the different nuances. Um, I feel like now a lot of the, the difficulty in our, our management is the availability of things like the humidified uh, high flow nasal cannula and so forth, that sometimes these patients are already super sick before, um, you know, we as pulmonary fellows or consultants have any, had even a chance to hear about them or, or to kind of try and uh, cut things off at the bend. So um, certainly things have changed very much from that point. So we've established uh, kind of the severity of everything that's going on. We're attributing it obviously to his influenza. 10% um, of the patients that you're going to come across in the ICU uh, are there for uh, ARDS and 25, you know, approximately a quarter of the patients who are on event um, have a diagnosis of ARDS. And the reality is we're probably not putting that name to it um, as frequently as we could be, should be. So we talked about that a little bit. Um, question two. Uh, uh, well, wait, let me see. I'm jumping around here. Okay, so your current vent settings, as we talked about, ACVC plus, aka PRVC, a respiratory rate, of 16, tidal volume of 550, PEEP of five, and FiO2 of 100%. So you're giving them pretty much everything you can uh, from the FiO2 standpoint. Uh, blood gas, as shown, and the patient is, again, as revised, is 65 inches tall. So I want to talk a little bit um, about 
and a later induced lung injury. Um, and again, Dr. Smith, I think just briefly touched on it as part of the intro. So this is something that um, has always been a big topic uh, for in our field and it's, you know, harming patients um, and with ARDS and our attempts to, you know, kind of uh, rescue them for their ants. So what are the major, the three major mechanisms of ventilator induced lung injury? Venal trauma, volume trauma, um, and absolutely, those are the two biggies. I don't know. Or infections. What was the other one? The infections. Yeah, so kind of like biotrauma, and really there's a fourth, this notion of atelectrauma, right? So atelectasis, kind of like the malignant atelectasis leading to trauma. So, um, yeah, as Vishnal actually said, you know, this concern about volume trauma, so that we're overextending the alveolar, uh, the alveoli walls, right? Um, and it kind of goes with this notion of atelectrauma, where we're artificially pumping in flow to these alveoli, causing collapse, opening and closing of these alveoli, uh, which already have kind of some disrupted surfactant mechanisms. They already have regional weight differences in their lungs um, from you know, pulmonary edema that's developed as related to this process. Um, so you're getting a lot of shear stress, like kind of like tearing, shearing forces um, of these alveoli that's thought to you know, further propagate ARDS itself. Um, and what's interesting is that what's kind of been noted uh, in, in more recent postmortem studies of these patients who have had the label of, sorry, I'm shaking my screen a little bit, of ARDS is that, um, you know, that the histologic correlate of diffuse alveolar damage, it's actually been noted less over the last 10 and 20 years on postmortem analysis. And it's thought that that's related to, well, maybe, you know, since this advent of recognizing the importance of low tidal volume inhalation as we're gonna to touch on, you know, maybe this is something that, uh, you know, we're not making a bad process worse by um, hopefully good, good critical care management. <clears throat> so um, as mentioned, so biotrauma, that was one that I, I always kind of, that's the one that always comes to my mind last. Um, so this idea that um, an inflammatory cascade of, of uh, you know, cytokine mediators like IL-6, IL-10, tumor necrosis factor um, that are just further causing an ongoing uh, disruption of the uh, alveolar cap capillary interface and, uh, you know, contributing to other multi-organ dysfunction. So undoubtedly, what we know is that patients with ARDS, when it's severe, do poorly um, oftentimes. And when they have multi-organ dysfunction or uh, concomitant pressor requirements, they do even worse. So that kind of goes along that idea that this uh, inflammatory or biotrauma that occurs is also causing problems. All right, very good. So touching on the next one, um, so how are we going to determine appropriate tidal volume? What are we calling appropriate tidal volume in this instance? So you'd want to figure out what his ideal body weight is and then do between four and six cc's per kilogram of ideal body weight. Absolutely. So um, I just always have, you know, an app on my phone with a calculator to calculate the ideal body weight. There's lots of good little uh, kind of like wallet size cards that have that chart. It's, 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 you know, and it's different for males versus females. And obviously it's based on the patient um, individualized, but um, so yeah, you know, this, this is kind of the mantra that, um, that we live by in, in uh, mechanical ventilation is that we're targeting four to six mils per kilo. Um, so this is based, you know, we've known this for 20 years on the basis of uh, what's known as the ARMA trial, A-R-M-A. Um, and this looked at two ventilation strategies. So there was the uh, low tidal volume ventilation, which was six mils per kilo in that group. And it was targeting a plateau pressure of less than 30 centimeters of water um, versus, you know, what was kind of, you know, viewed as a standard uh, um, standard ventilation of 12 mils per kilo uh, with a target plateau pressure of 50 centimeters of water. So the trial was actually stopped early because uh, there was higher mortality in the higher tidal volume lung group and it was 31 percent uh, mortality in the low tidal volumes to about 39, 40 percent in the high tidal volume or the 
standard higher tidal volume group. Um, so, and there was also greater ventilator free days in these patients in the low tidal volume uh, ventilation group. So I would say probably the, the biggest criticism that's very appropriate with this study is that, um, you know, if you do the math, uh, you know, this patient was supposed to be getting, oh, I can't remember what we calculated it out for their uh, 370 mils of uh, uh, tidal volume, right? I mean, you almost see nobody in the ICU on, you know, 12 mils per kilo, like even back then. So uh, the median prescribed tidal volume in the patients that were in this, you know, more relaxed tidal volume group was actually closer to 10 mils per kilo at the time of randomization. So they actually had to tweak it um, such that they had patients closer to 12. So um, kind of the idea at that time was that uh, really the best take from this study is that an empiric strategy of low tidal volume ventilation um, is probably better than an empiric high tidal volume ventilation. So, um, so I think that's a very fair criticism of this study, but obviously it really uh, kind of captured a lot of the concerns that were noted at that time. Um, so the ideal body weight for this patient um, you know, is uh, 65, for a 65 inch tall male is 62 kilos. So yeah, 62 kilos by six mils per kilo is 370 mils. Um, and yeah, so we're kind of the ATS guideline recommend tidal volume anywhere from four to eight and you're targeting a plateau pressure of uh, less than 30. So go to the next one. Uh, what do we think about the patient's PEEP? So the positive expiratory pressure. Um, are there benefits to higher PEEP? If so, what are our thoughts on that? So what do we think on this patient, a PEEP of five and an FiO2 100%? You, uh, if you get called by the medical student or the nurse at the bedside, I guess, what, what changes you want to make? I think we want to be on this patient. This five or ARDS, uh, so we have it's established fact that um, higher PEEP in ARDS helps recruiting the Alula, uh, and then that's one reason of higher PEEP, and um, and second reason is that you want to keep FiO2 as minimum as possible, or not close to 100, because there's a concept of oxygen toxicity in the lungs as well, or free radical injury. Injury, so you always try to keep the PEEP higher and FiO2 lower, in a negotiable range. You know how much power you can do it. So. Right. Very good. Any other thoughts on that? That's very nicely worded. Yeah, and I think the other, the other thing is like we the consideration is with higher PEEP, you think you have less like adult trauma um, than with like lower PEEP strategies. Right. And, and yeah, really kind of there was this faction out of the ARMA trial, you know, 20 years ago of people that, you know, actually getting on board with this idea of, you know, really low tidal volumes, you know, there's there's concerns with that. It's, it's you know, a little different to oxygenate patients. Some patients, especially... Um, you know, when not adequately sedated, they're, they're more prone to some ventilator dyssynchrony. It's not particularly a physiological natural state to be taking a, a smaller than smaller than usual tidal volume, right? So it kind of led to this, I, this open lung theory of management um, so that, um, you know, okay, well, we can't rely on higher tidal volume, certainly, but maybe with some higher PEEP levels, we can decrease the alveolar collapse associated with these strategies and, and kind of optimizing, um, uh, you know, the, the lung mechanics, this idea of baby lungs and ARDS, right? And, th and that's a term that you come across frequently where at the bases, patients have these very socked in consolidated areas of uh, lung that are not at all participating in any gas exchange. They're, they are dead weight in every sense of the word. Um, and and uh, really changes how we have to, you know, the strategies we use. So um, exactly as uh, as mentioned that you know obviously this has been looked at. So um, the alveoli trial uh, was one that came out. I think it was about five years after the original ARMA trial, um, and it looked at a higher versus a lower PEEP strategy. Um, and in the group that was kind of the lower PEEP strategy. Um, the uh, kind of the mean over, you know, the first days one through four of randomization was around eight, eight centimeters of water of PEEP. Um, 
compared to the, the higher PEEP group that had uh, around a target of 13. So they were initially starting, I believe, in the higher PEEP group. Um, they're trying for a target of 12, but they weren't getting enough delta or enough difference between the lower and the higher PEEP group. So then I think they had actually revised the uh, uh, revised it to target at least 14 of PEEP in the high, high PEEP strategy group for the first 48 hours. So um, interestingly with this, there really wasn't a difference in mortality. It's hard to, it's hard to demonstrate differences in mortality in, in ICU studies in general, but it was 24.9% in the low versus around 27 or 28% in the high, uh, high PEEP group, and that was not statistically significant. No difference in any other stuff like extrapulmonary dysfunction or barotrauma. Um, as you would expect, you know, higher PEEP led to higher PAO2 levels. So um, significantly higher PF ratio in the higher PEEP group. So um, this was on the order of uh, PAO2s that were around, or uh, PF ratios rather, that were around uh, 160s to 180s over the first few days in the low PEEP strategy group and then uh, PF ratios that ranged around 200s to 220s in the high P group. But again, this didn't necessarily translate to a mortality difference. Um, and, and with this, they were targeting, you know, a PAO2 of 55 to 80, kind of the usual things, and, and then SPO2 goal of greater than 88%. Um, there was another study in JAMA from 2010 um, again, looked at high versus low PEEP st strategy. So this was, you know, even five years after this, uh, about five years or so after the alveoli trial, there was no mortality benefit from higher PEEP in just undifferentiated or unselected ARDS patients. Um, but in subgroup analysis of patients who met criteria for moderate or severe ARDS, uh, there was mortality benefit. So it was 34.1% mortality in the higher PEEP group. Um, and 39.1% mortality in the lower P group. And this, uh, this did meet statistical significance. So again, this was in subgroup analysis, so you have to take that with a little bit of a grain of salt. Okay, questions on PEEP while we're on the topic. I wanna make sure we're not dragging too bad. Okay. Quick, quick question. Moving forward, so. Yeah, please. All right. So if I want to decrease the FIO2 on this patient and go up on the PEEP, so I change the PEEP by, let's say, two or three, and I check the SPO2, I bring down the FIO2 by five every time. How do yeah. you do it? Yeah, uh, exactly. So let me see if I, uh, let me see, actually, maybe I'll try and share the ARDSNET table that has the, uh, the lower PEEP strategy. Give me one sec here if it'll work. Let me try a new share. Da, da, da. Yeah, here it is. Because I thought this might come up. So yeah, this is what we see from, uh, you guys have seen this plastered all over bulletin boards in your hospital, I'm sure. So this is kind of that ARDSnet, very, very general summary of their protocol, right? So, um, and I think it varies by, some patients that, uh, you know, say you're at a, at a peep of, you know, starting at 20 um, and, pay, and somebody that's requiring that much peep, you know, using a higher peep strategy here. So um, these are based on uh, previous studies, kind of these FiO2 compared to peep uh, 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 ratios, I guess you could say. Um, but I kind of march it along, as you can tell, if you're following my cursor here, how it'll kind of just drop by two by two. And I would literally just kind of follow these uh, follow these tables in terms of how I drop it. If you if you really drop a patient's PEEP by more than two at a time, for example, um, it can actually kind of lead to a pretty significant clinical change in terms of them, you know, rapidly de-recruiting and um, and then you're you know playing catch up from that standpoint again. Um, so if I'm using the table, I follow the table. Uh, every patient certainly is going to be individualized, and, and uh, we'll kind of get into this to where, um, you know, patients who uh, are more PEEP responsive than others, for example, um, and those who don't have already very stiff fibrotic lung disease, for example, where um, you add just a little bit of PEEP and you see their plateau pressure shoot up with no change in their FiO2. And so a lot of it's going to be very kind of individualizing it to seeing how your patient responds. So I have seen it to where uh, 
clinicians will just continue to dial up the P um, while watching at the bedside what the plateau pressures are doing and what the SpO2 is doing on the bedside monitor. Um, as a pulmonary fellow, uh, you know, you'll be ordering a ton of ABGs early on. Um, but then, you know, I really encourage you to kind of, uh, it's easy to kind of get down the rabbit hole and, and just fixating on, you know, a five, a five uh, point difference in their PAO2 and, you know, one way or the other. And, uh, you know, you're, you're more likely just to phlebotomize the patient to needing a transfusion than it is actually making any big uh, changes to your decision making. Um, okay. When do you follow the lower the peep table and when do you follow the higher peep table? Yeah, so good question. Um, so varies very much by physician. Um, in patients who are already kind of meeting that criteria for moderate and severe ARDS, you know, at the outset of their presentation to you after being, you know, just put on the vent or in the ICU, patients with a P PF ratio falling in moderate to severe uh, territory. It would seem based on, you know, the, the one uh, study from JAMA that those patients may be more likely to benefit from a higher PEEP strategy. Um, but again, every patient, you're going to certainly tailor your treatment. And if you have a patient that comes in with terribly burnout, fibrotic lung disease, IPF at baseline, and then they're here with rip-roaring ARDS on top of that, um, you know, that obviously affects how much you can realistically apply a, a high peep strategy for example but that's a that's a great question i have a question about um, is there any role for getting the optimal peep for every patient and seeing what exactly they need any versus, role for that you said yeah versus just deciding yeah, yeah. And, and so like you said um i believe that has been looked at um to where they'll you know in, by by people looking at uh you know in terms of the optimal PEEP, seeing what the patient's compliance is and uh, or monitoring their driving pressure, right? So your driving pressure is the plateau pressure minus the PEEP that's applied. And um, we'll kind of touch on this here shortly as well, but um, some people will be more likely to uh, follow a patient's driving pressure um, to, to uh, titrate their PEEP to determine whether going up on PEEP uh, or going down on PEEP is going to be more beneficial, but that's a great question. We'll, um, we'll kind of get into some more of the nuances with that shortly. Okay. Uh, so we talked about that. So, uh, we made some ventilator changes. The patient's now on a rate of 22, still, uh, still on a rate of 22, tidal volume of 370. You have ramped up the PEEP uh, over a period of time from five to 16. Uh, you've been able to come down on their FiO2 to 85%. The peak pressure is 36 and the plateau pressure is 29. So that's kind of within our target, right? Keeping the plateau less than 30. Hour later, we've improved our PF ratio a little bit as ABG is 7.35, 46 and 120 for a PF ratio of 141. Um, still nothing that you're super proud of and you know, gonna hang on your wall, but it's, it's progress. Uh, so despite peep titration over the next 12 hours, the PF ratio is 124. Um, so this is, I mean, it really is a great case because this is what we run into. We think we're making some progress and then, you know, come in the next morning, the PF is worse than when we left in the evening. And, um, you know, you, you kind of find yourself now having to deal with these diagnostic dilemmas. Broadly speaking, um, if you're finding a patient in the first 24, 48 hours with optimal ventilator management, and by that we're saying, you know, you've you've done what you can from a PEEP standpoint and, and you know, made any ventilator adjustments to, to improve patient synchrony. Um, then you, a lot of these studies are, are uh, you know, kind of using the PF ratio of less than 150 uh, of, you know, determining efficacy. So things like proning the patient, things like uh, doing paralytics and so on and so forth. So given the severity of this patient's ARDS for question five, you wonder if this patient might benefit from early, early neuromuscular blockade, AKA paralytics. Has neuromuscular blockade shown a mortality benefit in severe ARDS? Thoughts? As far as 
I would guess it did not show any mortality benefit, uh, uh, neuromuscular blockage specifically. Um, I'm not sure about this term like early neuromuscular blockage. Um, I know, I guess uh, the whole scenario, like whole theme is whatever you want to do in ARDS, it should be early. If you wait, you're gonna lose the effect of uh, intervention in, in journal in ARDS. Um, so I'm assuming if you talk about early mortality, you do see some um, uh, improvement in oxygenation, I would say that, but overall mortality, I guess uh, the studies have not shown a clear cut benefit, if I'm right. Yeah, so I believe the accurate assist trial like, did show that there was a benefit, but there were a lot of confounding factors and the patients have like different variables. And then when they repeated it with the rose petal study, they didn't show any difference in mortality. Yep. Yeah, so a lot of the, um, a lot of the early literature from paralytics um, have come out of the, the French ICUs and, and a lot of their studies have, have really kind of been positive studies and, and shown some benefit. And, uh, just as you mentioned in the acrasis trial showing uh, that there was a mortality benefit. So that was using cystatricurium and I, it was over a 48 hour period in patients with early ARDS. So I think it was within a few days of um, being on mechanical ventilation. And they used patients with PF ratios of less than 150 and a PEEP of at least five. Um, and that there wasn't really any noted concern. So the big concern with neuromuscular blockade is that these patients have, you know, uh, are more susceptible to, um, you know, ICU acquired weakness, critical care myopathy, critical care polyneuropathy. And so that from a clinical standpoint, they didn't necessarily see that. Um, the, and this was, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, uh, and the ROSE pedal, uh, the ROSE trial from the pedal network that came out within the last year, uh, this kind of updated that. Um, and so ask the questions in patients, again, with moderate to severe ARDS, does the use of early continuous neuromuscular blockade um, with light sedation, uh, uh, you know, improve mortality? And so what was noted from that was that there is no mortality benefit from cystatricurium uh, at 48 hours in early ARDS. And I was using a PEEP of less than eight kind of as their cutoff. Um, in the intervention arm, there were some higher cardiovascular events that were noted, um, and it was thought just because these patients that are on paralytics are oftentimes requiring much higher sedation, you know, we're using biz targeted sedation, so um, it was thought that that was kind of the overall uh, uh, kind of reasoning behind that. So, so in and of itself as a therapy, um, you know, you're not going to see people just paralyzing a patient. Um, Oftentimes, what's occurring is that um, we're using low tidal volume ventilation. These patients are, especially younger patients, you're going to see this all the time. Younger patients are, are very difficult to kind of get synchronous on the ventilator um, just because, you know, they're, they're younger, they don't have any other comorbidities, and they're frequently more agitated and, and, and again, just difficult to sedate. So, um, you know, we're oftentimes seeing patients, uh, seeing, you know, clinicians use paralytics just from the standpoint of um, trying to improve ventilator dyssynchrony um, and really to kind of prevent the patient from, from being a harm to themselves. Um, the, the real threat of a uh, self-extubation in a patient with, you know, bad severe ARDS is, is catastrophic. We know in patients who, who extubate, uh, uh, who, who you know, self-extubate, for example, that they increase their length of time on the vent, they increase their uh, uh, duration of stay in the ICU. Um, so those types of things are, are you know, very real concerns, but uh, we have to balance that with the idea of, you know, you're not snowing patients and, and uh, you know, we finally get their lungs back to where they wanna be. And then, you know, we spend another two to three days trying to wake them up from, you know, being on all sorts of drips and so forth. So. Um, so yeah, kind of summarized from the, uh, the ROSE trial from the pedal network, it was stopped early for futility after a thousand patients were enrolled. No difference in 90 day mortality. It was 42% in the cystatricurium and 43% in the patients, uh, who were in the control arm of the group. Um, secondary outcomes of in-hospital mortality, event-free days, so on and so forth. Hus uh, and out of hospital days at all, 28 days were similar. 
Um, and again, there, uh, in this trial, there was more ICU acquired weakness um, and more serious cardiovascular stuff that was noted as well. So um, it definitely, uh, you know, again, I don't know if it necessarily changed anybody's practice because I don't think people, at least in the United States, were routinely using paralytics as a standalone therapy, usually more using as an adjunct with, uh, with proning or so forth. So any questions on paralytics? So, um, so one thing which always comes in, um, you mentioned about the young patients being more agitated, older patients being more synced with the vent. So um, if, if the patient is very well synced with deep sedation itself without any uh, need for a blockage, do we really need to do that? You know, because I've seen uh, a few of our attendings, uh, they are you know, not synced with the vent, they try intermittent or like try one or two doses of paralytics just to make them synced with the ventilator. Uh, my question is that if they are already synced with the vent, just with the sedation, and they are breathing with the vent, so do we really should do paralytic on top of it or you know, just leave it because that's the whole point of paralysis, right? We want them, we want right. them to be synced with the vent to avoid the trauma. Yeah, that, I, I think that's a component of it as well. Um, now, hospitals are going to vary by policy. Um, so we've had some patients when, and we'll talk about proning here shortly, you know, when we prone patients, the vast majority of the time, these patients are paralyzed as well. So I'm more likely paralyzing patients because I'm intent on, I'm proning them and I'm paralyzing them. Um, there's studies done where, you know, patients don't necessarily have to be paralyzed while proned, but um, from a logistic, from a practical standpoint, at most hospitals, you you know you'll get all sorts of uh, uh, you know very reasonable concerns from uh, nursing leadership there and respiratory therapy leadership about you know having a patient that's prone um, not be paralyzed because there again you a patient who self extubates for example and you know tubes are you can imagine somebody's laying on their belly you know uh, tube coming out is catastrophic you're trying to uh, you know. Uh, get them back supine in order, or in order to uh, reintubate them, or you're trying to reintubate them while they're proned. You know, it's just a, it's a complete nightmare scenario. So just from a practical standpoint, that's why. Um, my big knock, I would say, that doesn't really get routinely discussed as part of paralytics is that in a patient who's, uh, yeah, if if a patient is very synchronous with a ventilator, from my standpoint, they're less likely to have any real benefit from a from a respiratory standpoint from paralytics in and of themselves um, I think the big knock against them as I was getting into is that uh, what I've run into is that uh, especially in patients who are making copious secretions and then you've paralyzed them um, then you're just relying on your thin suction catheter to go out and get secretions so then these patients are, are very much prone to kind of uh, mucus plugging off and uh, you know you're, you're creating a whole host of issues where then you're you know having to do a bronchoscopy on a patient just to you know suction out secretions that we've been able to ineffectively clear in this patient who can't cough at all you know so that's a it's a great question it's but yeah so my my standard is I'm, I'm really not routinely paralyzing unless they're prone and, and I'm kind of at that crossroads of I need to get complete control of this patient um, and then, you know, kind of work backwards. So, um, so other treatment stat strategies, so we kind of already talked about it, so we can just dive right in then. Um, I don't know how much any of you guys happen to dive into the, uh, the proning literature. So looking at the placebo versus the prone, um, prone supine two study, uh, any thoughts on that? Anybody, uh, anybody know anything about that or come across anything related to that? So I've honestly never discussed the prone supine two study. Um, we always just talk about placebo. <laughs> I don't know about other people. We just focus on that where they had patients. I think the P, the P to F ratio had to be less than 150 um, on like five of P and like 80 FiO2, I think. And then, um, they prone them for 16 hours a day and they would have them like free supinate for eight hours versus usual care where they right. would stay supine. Um, and then looked at, uh, there was a decrease in mortality with that, like a pretty significant one. I think it was like 16 versus 32%. Yep. So yeah, the, you know, the, yeah, great, great summary. 
agree with that. So the uh, perceive, I mean, like you said, that's it's kind of been the gold standard for for proning protocol, and um, th this is all going to be spelled out for you. Um, at whatever hospital you rotate at and from the ICU standpoint is that, you know, the proning, uh, you know, it's usually for 16 hour protocols. And again, that's based on the Proceva, the prone supine two one, uh, I think did a, at least a 20 hour a day proning protocol. Um, Proceva showed mortality benefit, prone supine two didn't. And, and again, there's lots of all sorts of um, subtleties in that, that you could theorize why. One of the thoughts between the Proceva that, you know, the patients that were, uh, you know, prone were, were far more likely to be paralyzed as well. So there was some thought, well, were, were the paralytics in combination with the proning? How much was that contributing versus proning alone, for example? Um, Proceva, that was a manual proning mechanism versus the prone supine two. Um, and uh, that, the vast majority of patients uh, were rotoproned in like 20 of the centers. And then um, they were just manually prone in the others. Um, I don't know what your guys' experiences with both from a logistic standpoint. Even nurses now, I, I, I feel like I'm seeing manual proning much more at the hospitals that I rotated at at Indiana University. Initially, there was a lot of pushback from nursing and RT leadership, but now these rotoprone beds are very. Uh, there's, I mean, there's lots of difficulties for those those of you that have seen them. I don't know what your guys' experiences at the where you've done residency. Anybody manually prone or retro prone? I think my our, our program our hospital does not have only has manual proning. I've never seen other one at all, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, so we have all manual prone. I think in the surgical trauma I see there's two of the rotoprone beds, but we don't use them on the medical side at all. Yeah. So yeah, it's this is I feel like of all the therapies that we use, I'm kind of an early proner. And so this patients that are PF ratios less than 150, I spent 12 to 24 hours optimizing their PEEP. Um, uh, it's it's probably one of the less controversial things that we tend to do um, compared to some other things that people will try to, that we can touch on. So this patient, um, you've decided to manually prone and uh, uh, paralyze and Proceva over 80%, so there we go, over 80% of the prone arm was paralyzed. Um, the ventilator settings are listed. An hour after the patient is prone, the ABG is eh, about the same, PF of 159. Now they've got a peak pressure of 38 and a plateau pressure of 34. So what kind of concerns do you have about this patient's mechanics um, from, the, from the vent pressure standpoint? His, his pressures are high, so we worry about, again, trauma to lung or kind of lung injury, just because you want to keep the plateau pressure less than 30. Um, how to fix it? Uh, there are a variety of ways. I think uh, the first thing is to kind of decrease the pressures in general, but I don't think we have room for that, given this PF ratio. It's already high. Right. So, Thing uh, right now we are ventilating him at six minutes per kg. We have room in tidal volume to go down, and I see his pH is still 7.37 and PCO 43. You know that ARDS you can allow permissive hypercapnia. So decreasing the tidal volume um, will help plateau pressures or pressures in general in the system. So I think that should be yep. the next step in this case. Yep, I think it's I think it's very reasonable, very reasonable approach. Um, and there again, practically, you're looking at those plateau pressures that you're definitely, you know, you're not one to ride like this for forever. Um, you know, nurse tells you, oh, yeah, we, we just got done manipulating them or, you know, turning them from supine or prone, whatever the case was. So, yeah, you have to kind of take everything in combination. But, yep. Um, so this uh, kind of the teaching point from this standpoint is, is looking at this driving pressure, right? So we're looking at a plateau pressure of 34. And again, driving pressure. So um, this is the uh, uh, it's the the change of pressure for a given tidal volume. So plateau minus peak. So 34 minus 18. So that gives us what a driving pressure of 16, right? So um, this is kind of an evolving, uh, uh, I think, area where people are going to be looking at where we're shooting for driving pressures of less than 15. 
Um, a lot of this is kind of based on um, retrospective analysis of data where patients who had driving pressures that were higher um, had worse in mortality. It was a stronger predictor of mortality, much so more than what their tidal volume was or their compliance or anything like that. Um, so yeah, we this is something where there's going to be more studies that in the next certainly few years, I think are going to be showing up once everybody, you know, once we get out of the COVID era and people will go back to doing normal research stuff, hopefully, but um, something to kind of have in mind. So at this point, I won't belabor things. The PF ratio continues to be terrible at 71. The driving pressure you've optimized, um, uh, you've decreased the PEEP to 16. So that's another kind of strategy. I don't know that uh, we necessarily touched on as well. Um, so yeah, things are okay from an acid base standpoint, but, are, uh, but again, oxygenation is abysmal despite proning, despite neuromuscular and, you know, optimal uh, vent management. At this point, you don't have much room. Like I said, like, well, you know, what are we going to do? I mean, we're, we're kind of at a crossroads here. So somebody mentions, well, what about pulmonary vasodilators? Something like uh, nitric oxide or uh, prostaglandins that have been studied. What benefits have those studies shown? Is there a mortality benefit? Is there any concern for harm? Can I ask a quick question before we? Absolutely. So on the previous slide, I feel like the PaO2 is way above target. Therefore, the PF ratio looks worse. Isn't isn't that right? One thirty five yeah. PaO2. Yeah. The the you're saying right here. Am I highlighting the right area? Um. No. The third sentence. The, on the ABG, the PaO2 is 135 for an FiO2 of 85%. I feel like I could bring down the FiO2. Oh, for sure. For sure you could. So yeah, absolutely. This is not a terrible patient, I guess. No, this was not. But then um, the, the issue we ran into is that we had to decrease the PEEP um, in order to uh, kind of confront the, the plateau pressure. And then that's what resulted. So by decreasing the PEEP, we worsened the PaO2. So I think that's the concern with this patient now. Like, okay, we're, we're between a rock and a hard place. We're sacrificing uh, oxygenation for plateau pressure, you know, lowering. But yeah, this, this was fine, but, but the issue was the pressures. Got it. If the pressures were under 30, I could safely go down on the FiO2. Absolutely. To Right. Okay. Because yeah. the goal PaO2 is... And you should never be scared five. off by a PaO2 of the six, in the 60s. You're going to get called about that. A PaO2 is in the 65 on a whatever. You know, that's that's within the goal. That's what you're shooting for, 100%. Well, you know, not 100%, but I was, I was using that as a, as, a, as a turn of phrase. But that's what you're shooting for, is that, that 55 to kind of 80 range, right, for the PaO2. So vasodilator, so we think about things like inhaled nitric oxide, um, IV, epoprostenol, these types of things. Um, so yeah, you've, uh, you know, the question is, what benefits have these studies shown? Well, if there was some benefits, we'd be using them, right? So regularly. Um, so you know, with inhaled nit nitric oxide, there's been a bunch of meta-analyses done, um, and it can you know, like these things, they kind of make us feel better because they will at least cause some transient improvement oxygenation. Um, no mortality benefit with any of them, uh, unfortunately. There was one meta-analysis that showed actually there was some renal dysfunction in patients receiving inhaled nitric oxide. Uh, um, and then, uh, uh, oh, sorry, I don't know that it was inhaled, uh, but then uh, prostaglandins, same type of deal. The, these patients were more likely, uh, there's no mortality benefit, but a, a not insignificant number approaching 20% had uh, worsening hypotension that required titration impressors, for example. So, um, so that's the idea too, right? You've got, uh, you know, bad lungs kind of leading to a transmitted higher pulmonary artery pressure that, well, maybe if we cause some dilation, we, you know, we kind of, um, uh, relieve some of that, but it's, it's just not borne out in clinical practice. 
Um, I'll keep going for a little bit. I, I know that it's four. I want. Um, I have nowhere to be or nothing to do. So uh, you can anybody that needs to like do whatever you feel free. Um, but I'll uh, I'll kind of just keep going through a couple of these things as we touch into the next uh, next part of uh, part of this. Let's talk about steroids briefly. Thoughts on steroids. Have we reached the point where no patient dies without getting steroids in this patient? That's the, that's the other mantra in pulmonary, right? No patient dies without a trial of steroids. They don't think we've had any ARDS studies, uh, conventional ARDS that have shown mortality benefit, but you know. people usually end up getting it for one reason or another. <laughs> yeah, so I, I will say there's, there's, there's good data data um, that in patients with influenza um, and a few smaller studies that uh, with influenza in particular um, that, it, that it can cause an increase in mortality so when that's the underlying pathology uh, we are much more reticent to try it even, you know even in cases where the patient is you know kind of um, you know really at death's door uh, there, there's lots of problems with it it's thought to yeah. Uh, prolonged viremia and, and, and all sorts of things. Kind of some of the earlier concerns that were brought up with COVID-19, for example, which is, you know, very much a moving target as well. But um, so there's a 2006 study from uh, National Heart Lung Blood Institute and from ARDSNET that showed uh, no mortality benefit in corticosteroids. Large uh, randomized trials of steroids are lacking, unfortunately, but a meta-analysis of eight RCTs. Um, the issue is so many of the protocols differ. And when we say steroid, what do we mean? Are we talking about methylprednisolone? Are we talking about dexamethasone? Because that's in itself a big thing. So the big hot topic right now is the DEXA ARDS trial. Um, this was um, done in Spain. And this is just literally within the last six months. I think it was published in the Lancet, I wanna say. And it's very much a, from a patient population that was ap as applicable to us as pulmonary folks. So 80% of these patients had either sepsis or they had pneumonia, okay? So those are the big causes of ARDS, at least in our world, right? So multi-center trial, and they gave steroids to these patients pretty early on uh, with PF ratios of less than 200 after 24 hours of vent optimization. So um, they kind of allowed that 24 hour period to kind of rule out this idea of pseudo ARDS. So patients who had just terrible atelectasis or ter terrible heart failure, for example. So they gave IV um, uh, dexamethasone 20 milligrams for five days and then 10 milligrams for five days, which is a pretty good dose. Um, and if patients got extubated, they stopped it. And so they looked at the primary endpoint of ventilator free days, and it was 12 days for the group that received steroids and seven and a half days for the group that did not receive, uh, that was in the control group and the group that did not receive steroids. Um, a lot of these patients were paralyzed, prone, uh, so on and so forth. Um, uh, the study, really the big knock against it is that it wasn't blinded, um, but, you know, really there's not a lot of, been a lot of major criticisms with it. So a lot of this idea of extrapolating steroids for use in COVID-19 and coronavirus is really on the, on the back of this DEXA ARDS trial. Um, so it is absolutely kind of heightened interest in that, um, for sure. And, um, I, I think, um, Clinicians are still being wary about it, for sure, um, for, for all the reasons I mentioned about this concerns of, um, well, making sure we've ruled out some other underlying terrible, you know, infectious etiology that can that could blow up on us or uh, prolonging viremia uh, or viral shedding and so forth. So, um, so I'm, I'm kind of in that camp, too, where I'm, I'm more likely to kind of hold off uh, uh, in the first couple of days unless unless this is a patient where, you know, we're, we're really at the end of the line and we've ruled out influenza, some of those things that we know it can absolutely be bad in. But anybody have any experience or questions or thoughts on that? So. Um, last thing I'll just touch on real briefly is uh, ECMO. Um, 
so this is something I had like literal now literally no knowledge about when I started fellowship like I, I knew what it stood for and that was probably about the extent of it so uh, you know broadly speaking when we talk about ECMO um, you guys have ECMO centers where you're going to be yay nay no. yeah yes um, so yeah we have a, a fairly robust one at Indiana University as well and um, at, at Methodist Hospital is, is where ours is located and um, so very much uh, kind of a moving target I think so the big trials were this or the Caesar trial and then the one that uh, the Eolia trial that came out in the last couple of years as well that the big issues with ECMO research is patient selection because if you pay um, you know, choose patients that are so sick that they're going to die no matter what, then certainly you're not going to find a favorable outcome with your therapy, right? Um, so that's the one thing. Um, the one most recent trial, the Eolia trial, for example, it allowed patients just because, it, you know, there's this concern about, um, you know, is this unethical? Are we withholding a potentially life-saving therapy for some patients? So, in patients that were randomized to the, the non-ECMO group, they were allowed to cross over to receiving ECMO, um, uh, you know, just if the clinicians felt this is the right thing to do and we need to just pull them out of this arm of the trial. So that's, that's kind of something that's important to know um, just in general with ECMO research, I think. Again, that's just my own personal perspective. But um, Broadly speaking, it should be considered when mortality is 50% or greater. Um, so a lot of times uh, clinicians will calculate a Murray score, which looks at the degree of consolidation of lungs based on no quadrants to four quadrants of a consolidation, looking at the PF ratio, um, their PEEP requirements, and their compliance. And just like on UpToDate or any others, uh, online calculator tools, you can calculate it. And if it calculates a mortality of 50% or higher, you know, it recommends referral to an ECMO center. So really the only thing you can do wrong is not thinking about it as a possibility. Um, so you're thinking about it in the patient who was really previously healthy, the patient who lacks um, other multi-organ disease. So the 70 year old patient with heart failure and uh, CKD stage four is probably the someone that's less likely to benefit from an aggressive therapy like this. Um, the CSER trial uh, looked at 180 patients and um, really just looked to see whether it was safe to do and whether it was cost effective. Um, and, you know, death or disability was 63% um, at six months in the ECMO group versus um, conventional 47%. The EOLIA trial was a larger group um, and it showed, you know, more favorable. So 35% mortality at 68 uh, at 60 days rather than the ECMO group versus 46% conventional vent management. So almost 30% of the patients in the control group ultimately crossed over to the ECMO group. So um, those patients, as you can admire, had more bleeding events, had more severe platelet dysfunction and thrombocytopenia, um, but they weren't able to, to determine that there was a benefit over traditional management. But um, you will, you will absolutely see people die on the hill that it, it has saved lives. And, and just like anything, you know, you have to kind of think about who the, who the patient is that's most likely to benefit. And, and that's, you know, really just in consultation with the folks who do this every day for a living. So, so I'll kind of pause there and, and um, kind of leave it at that. I, I certainly want to open it up for any questions questions that people for people who have stuck around or, or anything like that I do um, have a question and I would like rather kind of ask you what would you do in those situations like um, it's about proning so um, so for example there's a patient who does not meet the criteria set by um, the trial uh, like the PF ratio is kind of around 160 170 or maybe 200 but their disease is mostly in the posterior lungs maybe it was a aspiration event or something Right. So, to consider proning those patients, start up realizes all the disease in the posterior lungs, but the PF ratio is not falls into severity or like you know moderate to severe range. Would you prone them earlier, or you just going to treat conventionally? Yeah. So, so is the question then, Michelle, whether whether you're going to prone that patient yeah. or not? Sorry, I, 
ये खैर है यार ओके whether you you would prone the patient despite their pf ratio not being that severe yeah great that's a great question and i think that's something where where people kind of you know wonder that a lot um i think in general you're going to see it unlikely that a patient's going to be prone because when we're committing to proning a patient uh you know we know it's a very labor intensive things for our nurses and for our respiratory therapists and a lot of the the idea with proning is that well we're doing it because we're we're trying to meet a target you know pf ratio and then kind of going from there so so for me if if i've already got a patient who they you know like you said their pf ratio is kind of close to 200 and you know they're they're kind of muddling along okay for those first couple days i i think i'm okay just It's kind of watching and waiting from that standpoint, um, but it, it's it's a great question. But but yeah, ultimately the the patients with moderate to severe were the ones that were more likely to benefit. So the likelihood is you're just creating kind of more uh, more problems for your ancillary staff with with probably not much greater benefit in oxygenation, I guess. I have a question. So um, we had a well, it was a COVID patient with the ARDS, and he was so his PF ratios kept dropping, and then we'll prone him, and they'll be better, and then so it was kind of like uh, we're just chasing our tails there. So one night I was on, and his PF ratios came back at like 124, and I was thinking about proning him, but my attending said we were like chasing numbers, so. and we didn't really prone him and i think he was fine later so i guess my question is at what point do we not prone like is it after the first at what point is proning not essentially like beneficial when do we just stop yeah great question i i think it's really really when you start to get into that um you know the later stages of ARDS or you know especially when patients are you know really in the deep in the inflammatory phase and starting to get into the into the you know fibrotic phase um so my experience has been that when people use it they're more likely to use it early on with with greater effect i would say um because like you said every you know as i as i've harped on many times already you're you're certainly going to individualize this for every patient and you know if you have a patient that's 250 you know 280 pounds north of that it, it certainly affects you know you know you're not trying to deprive them of a therapy you think they're necessarily going to benefit from but you're you you also want to be sure that the therapy you're trying is going to not gonna lead to some disastrous consequence that you know the ET tube falls out or their uh, central line falls out or or some some issue related to that standpoint um i've had patients who i you know who actually do worse um and and it's sometimes it's inexplicable to me who you know they they become incredibly hypercarbic and I'm doing all sorts of vent changes after I've proned them um to where they just simply haven't tolerated it so um there's no doubt a, a trial and error aspect to some of that and and you know you see some patients who just respond marvelous marvelously to it you have them proned for maybe 48 hours and then um you know you're able to get them back supine but um it's it's yeah it's a great question and and we run into that where you know you you're you're trying it and and sometimes you have a good reason for not trying it and that's you know that's kind of an example there where they're already well into their course and you're not sure whether the the risk out the benefit outweighs the risk and when you paralyze somebody do you paralyze them for 48 hours and stop or how do you do that Yep. So, um, the great question. Um, and, and we've done this with a lot greater expertise, expertise and, and, um, uh, you know, facile of, of, uh, protocol, um, in, in the COVID era too, because we've paralyzed and prone way more patients in the last few months than I had, you know, in years prior combined. Um, so typically if I'm paralyzing and proning a patient, um more often than not you're seeing if they can tolerate being supine first as your sequence while leaving them paralyzed and then you're kind of uh you know maybe over the next day or so trying to get them off the paralytic as well i think what's super important when using paralytics is that um you have a patient very deeply sedated as well to where 
um, that this level is extremely low or, uh, you know, you know, target range of, you know, 30 to 40 and I, Innovated patient who's paralyzed, but you really want a very low BIS level, a very deeply sedated patient as they're kind of emerging off of that paralytic. Um, because I've seen that time and time again, too, where a patient's, you know, kind of on the light side of sedation while paralyzed, but then all of a sudden they start waking up, they become dyssynchronous with the vent, and reflexively we say, okay, well, let's reparalyze them and so forth. So I think that's kind of an important strategy with that as well. Um, so kind of being very mindful about sedation while you're coming off a paralytic is, is very important. I absolutely try and avoid paralyzing for more than 48, more than 48 hours. I've seen patients, especially in the COVID era here, paralyzed for four days, five days, very routinely. And, and I, I do have major concerns about the, the concerns for ICU acquired weakness going forward. I think it's going to be more than we've ever seen. So um, that's, that's something that we're going to have to get better at. Now the question, I heard about the concept of high inflection point. Is that theoretical or can you actually measure it and adjust your PEEP below that level? Yeah, it's, it's more theoretical um, with these, oh golly, with these, uh, some of these new ventilators, I don't want to get into brand names and all that, but you can actually, you know, have display graphics on the screen that will allow you to kind of chart compliance and use that. Um, uh, uh, to, to titrate whether you're over peeping or under peeping. The long story short is that yes, it's more of a theoretical benefit when that has been looked at to, to, for using that. Um, there's not been shown to be any benefit. Any other questions? Great, all, awesome discussions all around. I, I really appreciate it. Um, my, my parting words, I guess, is that felt, there, I'm sure is just this weird trepidation at the time you guys are starting fellowship, but, um, and, and that's totally natural and, and normal and very appropriate, but um, this, it is just such a rewarding field. Like I, you know, I wouldn't want to do fellowship all over again, but I would happily do it again, just knowing that I could still be a, you know, pulmonologist and an intensivist. Um, it's, it is so gratifying. And, and I think you guys have all made an awesome career choice and, um, you got my name, so feel free to, you know, uh, reach out at any point and, and uh, wish you all the best. Thank you so much for taking the time to teach us. Today. Yeah, well, thank, thank you. you guys. Thank you. Good luck to first year. Thanks. Thank you.